You are tuned in to Respect My Crown, the podcast. This is Jillian J.J. Simmons. All month, we have been talking to some incredible women, phenomenal women who are doing great work around domestic abuse and advocating and bringing awareness and prevention uh, to this issue that has affected me directly. And a lot of people have heard my, my testimony a few times. Um, this woman that we have on the show today, Tamiko Lowry Pugh, she's often referred to as the empowering diva. She is a voice for women's empowerment. She is a CEO of Empower Me, life coaching and consulting, a personal development and lifestyle enhancement firm for women. She's also the CEO of Still Standing Publishing, a book publishing company that publishes memoirs and self-help books. And she's the founder of the Still Standing Alliance, a nonprofit organization that focuses on domestic violence awareness, advocacy, and prevention. Tamiko has constructed a powerful movement dedicated to the empowerment and personal development of women around the world. And she's a compassionate mentor and friend and enthusiastic leader and visionary. She's also Watch this, an international best-selling author. She is a domestic violence expert, and she believes that empowerment comes from within and that it can be achieved by honoring yourself, your values, and expressing your talents and gifts. I met this woman, uh, we met years ago, <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh, Tamiko's going to have to remind me because, you know, my memory nowadays, it only goes back to last week. <laughs> so my oh, brain I- can't go back <laughs> But I want to introduce you to Tamika Lowry Pugh. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, JJ. Thank you so much for having me. I think a couple of people were like, you really need to meet JJ. She's awesome. She's doing phenomenal work in Houston. And I started following you on social media. um, And we were just talking through email. Someone did an email introduction. I can't remember who it was, but from there... um, you know, we stayed in contact. You went on your book tour and I wanted to make sure that I supported you. You were in Atlanta and I'm like, how can I not support her? I'm in Atlanta. So I yes. wanted to make sure that I supported you and love the work that you do. So I love the work that you are doing. And just to show you that Tamiko is the real deal. Um, just, what was it? A couple of weeks ago, I called Tamiko and I said, Hey, I have a friend who's getting ready to go to court and testify against her uh, ex-boyfriend who was uh, an abuser and who's currently stalking her. And we need somebody to, to advocate for her, someone who can talk, you know, on behalf of, you know, survivors or, you know, people who really understand what domestic abuse is. And Tamiko's like, girl, I got somebody who can go do it for you. And, and, and this is the type of work that she does. So Mm -hmm. uh, my girl is really doing the work and I don't know any people who do this type of work who don't have a story to tell, Mm -hmm. you know, is there a a life experience or some type of, you know, place of pain that connects you to this kind of cause? Where does it come from? Yes, absolutely. It comes from my own personal experience with domestic violence. Um, This year made 11 years that I have been free, that I have been a survivor. Um, And so um, July 7th of 2007 was the day that I left my abuser. Um, Prior to that, he had been emotionally abusive, um, spiritually abusive, financially abusive, and of course, physically abusive. But that came towards the end. And so oftentimes a lot of people um, don't understand that you can be abused emotionally and physically, uh, emotionally and, and spiritually and verbally, um, as well as financially. And so that's what I experienced early on. Um, and just that alone had me completely broken before he ever laid a hand on me. You know, I often tell people I was completely broken and it's easy to say, you know, I have a broken arm. It's easy to recover from that. It can heal, but how do you heal a broken spirit or a yeah. broken heart? You know what I mean? And so, just kind of being broken down to that point by the time he began to hit me, I thought I deserved it. Um, So that's how it, you know, they don't start out on the first date, like, Oh, I'm going to slap you. You know what I mean? It starts off with the emotional abuse, with the verbal abuse and until you're just kind of broken. Um, But thankfully I was able to survive that. The day that I tried to leave him was the day that he actually tried to kill me. 
Oh, um, he strangled me and, and beat me until I was unconscious and left me on in the middle of Interstate 85 with cars oh, swerving around me, trying to prevent from hitting me, blowing the horn. Um, but it was by the grace of God that I made it and I'm still standing. Um, so wow. hence, still standing is, is really the what I stand on. Still yeah. Wow. What a testimony. Gosh, you know, and you, it's so funny when you look at someone now, you know, you would never think that you would experience that. And one thing that bothers me the most when I hear um, people's judgment on victims, um, or maybe just their perceptions is just, you know, gosh, you seem so strong. You know, how in the world, like, how did you let that happen? You know what I mean? And, right. you know, a lot of people don't realize just because I am strong, it doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, it doesn't mean that I can't experience these types of relationships. How Absolutely. long were you together? You know what? We were together five years, but it felt like a lifetime. It was like, it felt like a lifetime of misery. Yeah. Um that in that short period of time, I was just, you know, I lost all my confidence, all my self-worth. So it, it felt like a lifetime. Yeah. Um, well, I'm so glad that you have this testimony to share that will impact so many um, women. And, you know, what I believe is that sharing your truth is a way for people to grow. And um, I- I've seen it you know, so many times the stories that I read and just ex- personal experiences where I'm, and it seems like in the last couple of years, I've seen so many women in abusive relationships. And, you know, something that you, you mentioned was the spiritual and financial um, abuse. Can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit more about, you know, what that looks like in a relationship? Yes. Yeah, so even with the financial abuse, um, when I met him, I was a single parent with two children. And one of the things he said was, I want to take care of you. And oftentimes we think that being a housewife and having our spouse take care of us, like that's, you know, like we hit the jackpot, like, man, he wants to take care of me and my kids. I don't have to work. This is great. But what I didn't realize is that it was financial abuse. He was, he controlled the finances, which meant I only got an allowance. I really didn't have access to a lot of the funds. I was um, able to work part time, but you know, that was just money for me to do small things with if I wanted to hang out with my girlfriends or something like that. Um, But when it came time for me to leave, I didn't have anything. And so when people say, well, why don't you just leave? I'm like, where am I going to go? I don't have access to these bank accounts. You know what I mean? Like I just, I didn't have it. And so even when I did step out on faith and leave, I was evicted three times that first year um, just because I wasn't financially prepared. But, you know, for me, it was better than being in in the seven bedroom house with him. And so I left a seven bedroom mansion pretty much to live in a one bedroom apartment with two children sleeping on the floor. But I had more peace in that one bedroom apartment than I had had in the past five years. But um, so that's kind of like what financial abuse looks like. It also looks like that person, maybe they're just giving you a weekly allowance. You know, you don't have access to the funds or maybe it's the opposite where you're making all the money and, and they're sitting at home um, taking your paycheck. So oh. it can kind of go either way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then, of course, you know, you think about spiritual abuse, which we don't often talk about, but using biblical scriptures to justify the behavior of being controlling and having the woman submit to the husband, um, you know, and even just going to church saying, hey, I need help. And them saying God hates divorce. And so at this point, I'm, I, I feel horrible that I want to get a divorce because, the, you know, at church, they're telling me God hates divorce. You need to go home and pray over him and lay hands over him. And you're I'll fasting and praying and but you're still being abused. So. Um, that's what spiritual abuse looks like using yeah. scripture to justify the behavior yeah. um, that's oh abusive. My. And I, you know, it took me a long time to realize that God does not want us to be abused. Like he is a loving and, and caring God. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's not the author of confusion, but of peace and a sound mind. So yeah. where does abuse fit in if he's the God of peace and a sound mind? It, it doesn't. 
Yes. And that's the, you know, that one word is something that sticks out to me most when I think of the two abusive relationships that I was in emotionally, mentally, psychologically, verbal, abusive relationships. It was confusion. It was, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I, I, I tell women all the time, like, pay attention. Do you feel confused <laughs> you know often is the gaslighting the manipulation the yes. tri- triangulation um and and it's just like you said a lot of people don't realize that these other types of abuse are more painful and harder to heal from because they are so insidious and i don't you know one big thing too is people don't believe you you know, right. when, yeah. you know, that has to be like, you're already trying to heal and, you know, just from what you've experienced. And then imagine when your own family and friends and, you know, people in the, just in the world, like they just don't believe you, you know, how do, how do people push through that? It's very difficult because What it does is it kind of almost forces the victim to stay because people don't believe you or they're being judgmental. Um, You know, one of the things that I ran into was, oh, well, we see you guys out all the time and he seems like a great guy. He has a great personality. He's very charming. Yeah, he's very charming in a controlling way. Um, And so on the outside looking in, it's like, oh, you got a car, a new car every year. He, you know, you guys have this beautiful home. But do you know what goes on inside of that home? So even my family, you know, my mom was like, at one point, I was like, I can't do this anymore. You know, I just, I'm unhappy. Um, I I, I, want to leave. And she was like, girl, unhappy with everything that you have. She was like, you got a three-story house. You could go on the third floor and, you know, to get away from him if that's the case. And I'm like... It's more than just me going on the third floor. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? It's right. the presence of him in the house. And that she just, even she didn't get it until afterwards. And I'm not saying anything bad about my mom because she's my biggest supporter now, especially, you know, um, doing the work that I do. But she just yeah. didn't get it. And she came from, you know, the old school. And it was like, what happens in this house stays in this house. And yep. if a man took care of you, then, you know, that was great. Yeah. That's so true. I'm trying to now break these generational chains and teach these younger people that, um, you know, you're about self-worth and loving yourself and, you know, giving them the tools to see what an abusive relationship, you know, looks like um, and how to heal. When you came out of that relationship, When did you decide, you know what, I want to advocate and how did you go about it? Oh, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Very interesting. Um, Very interesting testimony how I knew it was time to advocate. So, you know, I'm out of this relationship. Two years later, I remember sitting in church and the pastor was preaching from Romans 8 and 28. Romans 8 and 28, the purpose scripture, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. And he was talking about purpose and he was talking about the things that we go through in life and how when we go through those things, it's not for us to hold on to the victory that we have to share it with other people. Like it's our job to go back and help other people. That's a part of our purpose. And it just kept ringing in my head, purpose, purpose. What's, what was the purpose of me going through that? Because prior to that sermon, I was crying out to God, like, why did you allow me to go through this? Why did I have to be hurt? Like, why me? What did I do? And it was at that moment that I realized that it's a part of my purpose. It's a part of what I'm supposed to do. It's a part of me going back and helping those women or men who are going through what I survived. It would be selfish of me not to. So I kind of feel like it's something I have to do, but um, I, it's rewarding. At the end of the day, it's very rewarding to be able to help someone like your friend that needed someone to go to court with her. I know what it was like going to court by myself. So I yeah. try to make sure that we have those resources for other people who are dealing with those same issues. Yeah. We're so grateful to have you 
doing this work. I was just thinking about, you know, some of the women that I've spoken to. I do self-love coaching. Oh my Um, gosh, that work is so necessary. It's so necessary. And most of these women have come out of abusive relationships, specifically narcissistic abuse. Mm, And so they want someone that they can just confide in. They want a safe space, you know, just they want somebody who can say, I, I understand. And, um, one of my clients, she said, she was telling me about her, her ex that she just sent to jail for 10 years. Um, I mean, she, you, she had staples in her head, like everything. Wow. Like it was, oh it was really bad. And she had gone back to him several times and this was the last time. And they have, you know, two children together. And, um, to me, I just think about her trying to heal and something that has really driven her crazy in this healing process is having to go to court and, you know, still having to now, you know, the parole hearing is coming up. So now I got to go to the and, and something that really shocked me was her, the lack of support from her family. And they're very spiritual. And you, you mentioned, you know, the spiritual abuse which I think is interesting because while we talk about the spiritual abuse in the intimate relationships, it does really seem like there's that spiritual abuse that's kind of on the outside of the relationship where you do have those people who are like, no, marriage is forever. Okay. He put staples in your head, but you know, this is your husband and you know, he, right. can, he can change. He can change and God can heal him. He probably can heal him, but do we have to be in the same house while that healing is taking place? Do we have to be together while he Right. Heals? Do we even have to be together? At the, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's tough. And I just wonder, you know, when, when, what advice can you give to women who are maybe coming out of those types of relationships, they're ready to get their life back. Um, but they're still dealing with the, the drama feeling like it's never going to end. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, that's, it's part of the healing process, being able to navigate, um, through that whole system of not always having the support you want from your friends and family. But I would say, Um, Even for me, even just having that one person that I could confide in and that one person, I had one friend that stuck by my side the entire time and she would be like, you need to get out the house. We're going to the movies. We're going to go out to dinner. You know, we're going to do this. And she really helped me to kind of um, start to navigate back into regular society because you're you get to the point where you lose yourself and you don't know who you are anymore. So I literally had to figure out who Tamiko was like, what's my favorite food? Well, you know, the person I was the, my abuser, he liked pizza. So I like pizza. Well, yeah. my favorite color became his favorite color. And so I just had no identity. Um, so being able to, like you said, you're a self love coach. So learning to love myself all over again and loving, loving myself all over again meant almost like dating myself and doing those things for myself that I would expect someone else to do and treating myself kind. Sometimes we're not even kind to ourselves and we inflict um, the victim mentality or abuse on ourselves thinking that we're not worthy of certain things. So learning really to love myself all over again, loving my flaws, the things that that person said were horrible about me, you know, Oh, you got a funny look and your, your lips are funny, whatever it was, but learning to love every bit of me, even my goofy personality that I was always told, oh, you're too goofy, you know, things of that nature. So being able to embrace the person that God created me to be. So that's one of the things, learning to love yourself, having a a really good support system. If you don't have a support system, um, nowadays we have social media. So there's a lot of support groups out there that you can find just by Googling or going on Facebook or social media. Um, So I think those are the things that are important, a support group and really learning to love yourself all over again. That's really good. That's really good. You have a book publishing company that Mm -hmm. publishes memoirs and self-help books. And uh, I know 
from some of your past work, you know, you're sh- they're sharing stories of abuse, right? Their personal stories. How important is it to share your truth? And when did you get the courage to share yours? So it's very important that we share our truth, that we share our testimonies, that we share, you know, whatever it is that God brought us through, it's important that we share that. Um, one of the things is, it breathes hope into other people who are going through what you survived. So our testimonies and our stories are not just for us, but it's for those other people that we get to bless those other people um, who are going through the exact same thing. And it gives them some type of hope to move forward in life. I also believe that um, sharing our stories, it brings glory to God, right? Yeah. It brings glory yeah. to God for the things that he's brought us through. It helps us to reflect on what we've been through in life. Um, so there's so many different reasons why it's important that we share our stories. You know, just even just to be um, a blessing to someone else. Yeah. Even if they haven't gone through it, they can understand what the signs are. They can understand what it looks like. Um, so that they don't go through that same thing. And one of the thing I one of the things I always say is stories, our stories are like a community garden. It's like um our testimony is a community garden. And so a garden is something that grows and flourishes. And if 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 you're sharing your testimony, you're helping the community to grow and to be better. Yeah, I love that. That's so true. That's so true. So when you first shared your truth how did you do it girl that was one of the hardest things I ever in my life had to do was to literally share my truth because I would share on social media about domestic violence statistics and things of that nature but no one ever knew the story behind it and you know everybody's like you you got to tell your story like people need to understand what your passion is behind this and I'm like I'm embarrassed I just Mm -hmm. don't know what people are going to think. Like I started this nonprofit, but no one knew why I did it. And I just remember, (laughs) I remember writing it down, just kind of like a a couple of paragraphs about what happened in that relationship. And I posted it on social media and so many people started inboxing me saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I went through the same thing. Thank you so much for sharing. You're so relatable. And so when I realized that it was helping other people, I wanted to share it more. Yeah. Um, and so I started, you know, looking for opportunities and places to go where I could just share it, whether it was at, you know, um, a domestic violence shelter, um, you know, at, or at a church group, you know, I just wanted to share my story. I never did it for the business of it or to get paid for it. I did it because I wanted to make a difference. Yeah. Um, and then when I wrote my book, um, wounds to wisdom, that's when it really kind of, it took off on the business side, which I really wasn't expecting that. Um, But then people began to see me as an, I guess, as an expert. You know, you write a book, they assume you're an expert. So Mm -hmm. I had to start really educating myself on the topic and what it looks like and what is narcissism and and all those things. So um, that's when I knew it was time to share when people were trying to figure out why in the heck is she so passionate about this cause? Like, what is it? Yeah. Um, And so sharing the story, I had to do it. It was difficult. It's not always easy. You know, you make it look easy. We make it look easy. But at the end of the day, you have to realize every time you share that story, you're reliving what you went through. So you're reliving a trauma. Yeah. And so you have to go home. You might not cry in the middle of the speech, but when you get home, you're exhausted. And it's really emotionally exhausting. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said before, it's not all, it's exhausting, but it's rewarding. I'm a, I would assume you went to therapy after your relationship. Oh, what? absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I went to therapy. Yes. How did to. that process start? Like, you know, did you sit back and say, did someone tell you you need to see somebody or, you know, how did you start that process? Well, at that time I was working part time um, for a, it was like a major company that he he actually worked there too and got me a job part time. Hence the controlling spirit, so that I could be right next to him. Wow! But um, it was a really great company, and they had a great program um, 
where you could, you know, get counseling and, and things of that nature. And it was just recommended that I take some time off and, and go to therapy. At first, I didn't want to do it. I was like, I'm not crazy. But I spent so much time crying and, and being depressed. I, there were times where I wouldn't even probably for three months, I couldn't even get out of the bed and get dressed and comb yeah. my hair, like walking around, literally just looking crazy. And I remember looking at that phone number. It was like, I need to call this number. And I called the number. They connected me with a the therapist. And um, it was probably the best decision I ever made because my children needed therapy as well. So mm. me going to therapy and then later on bringing them with me, it really helped us um, as a family because sometimes you think you're doing something and you're staying in this relationship for the children or, you know, for the money or whatever it may be. And they were like, mommy, we ain't like him. We wanted you to leave a long time ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, yeah. being able to hear their side and having them feel comfortable sharing with the therapist how they felt, it was, that was very important. I mean, and then you, I can see the progress. Like my therapist was like, oh my gosh, when you first came, like your hair was all over the place. Like you just like literally had on like pajamas. And then as yeah. I kept going, I got stronger. And she's like, oh, wow. Like, you know, three months ago you came in here, like you just didn't care today. You like a totally different person. Like I started to take care of myself again. Um, so therapy is important. It's, and it I didn't is. even realize I needed depression medication. Like I had to get on medication. Yes. Just to kind of balance my emotions, um, yes. and, you know, things, something I couldn't do on my own. Yeah. I, I, in our community, we say, girl, it's going to be OK. Pray about it. Or we turn into alcoholics like, girl, we're going to have a drink and get over. Oh, this. girl. Isn't right. That, <laughs> isn't that the truth? And that is so scary. We're just, you know, we're not treating the wound. We're just putting, you know, a little mm. you know, scorn on it. <laughs> like, come on, girl. Y'all. We got to do something. Yes. More. <laughs> putting a band-aid on it. And that brings yeah. me to something I heard Auntie Ayana Van Zant say. She <laughs> said, until you heal the wounds of your past, you will continue to bleed. And it makes me think about that wound that it's not completely healed. Oh, and yeah. it continues to bleed. And we keep picking at it and it continues oh, to bleed. Yeah. Oh, oh, my yeah. goodness. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I do similar work and it can be very, very draining. Do you ever feel drained? And if so, how do you fill yourself back up? Absolutely. You know, the work that we do, we're, it's full of emotions. And so you're, you're constantly dealing with other people's emotions and what they're feeling. And just the work itself just can be really, really draining. Um, I think I said earlier, every time you share your story or every time you're helping a domestic violence victim or you're doing this work, you're reliving your own trauma. Um, and so it can have an effect on on your emotions and your mental capacity. And so um, there are days when I just feel sad for no reason, or I'll just be emotionally drained. And my husband will be like, are you tired? Why are you, why are you tired? And I'm like, it's not that I'm physically tired. I'm just emotionally drained. And so mm -hmm. what I've learned, self-care is takes priority um, over anything that I do. And so learning how to say no, because sometimes you're so passionate about the work and you keep going and keep going and learning how to say no. And what I have to do is turn off my phone, turn off social media, even if it's for 24 hours. And then the other thing that works for me um, is I cannot go a day without prayer and meditation. I mm. have to start my day with prayer and meditation because I, it prepares me for the day. And then at the end of the night, I do the same thing. I go into a quiet place and I love the sound of water. Um, and so what I do is I have one of those, um, those little um, water faucet things that makes it sound like you're in the ocean or I'll play music from YouTube that sounds like nature. And I will just yes. literally sit there in silence. Um, meditation has really, learning how to meditate and sit in silence has really helped me. And then also doing something that makes you feel good. I love to dance. And so there are times where I will just turn on some music, girl, and I will dance because yes. that's how I release my frustration. I love to dance. Oh, so, Tamika, we're going to go to a dance party. I don't have yes, no rhythm. So. I'm just going, I don't have no rhythm, so don't judge me, but I like to dance too. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, finding that thing that makes you feel good. It, you know, whatever it is, that's what you can use to decompress. And for me, I love to dance. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you, how can people, how can people advocate? Like how, if there is someone who's listening right now, maybe they're, they haven't been in an abusive relationship, but they know somebody who is currently going through one or maybe coming out of one, you know, how can they support and advocate and become allies for domestic abuse awareness? So there are several, several different ways that a person can advocate on behalf of domestic violence victims. Um, one of the ways is if you're a survivor of domestic violence, by simply using your story and sharing your story as a form of advocacy, you're sharing your story is the most powerful advocacy tool um, that we have out there because it allows people to be able to connect to the cause. And so when people have a direct connection to something, um, they want to support it or when they understand it a little bit better. So the first form of advocacy is literally sharing your story as a survivor. Um, the other thing that you can do um, is continue to educate yourself on the topic. Use social media, share statistics, um, there are so many different websites that have statistics, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. They have a list of statistics that you can share. Um, you can advocate on a political legislative level. Um, so over the course of the past few years, um, I've been able to legislate um, nationally and on a local level as it relates um, to politics. And so in the state of Georgia, we, we recently were able to um past legislation where the Crime Victims Bill of Rights has been added to the Constitution, whereas prior to that, only the accused had constitutional rights. So that's a way that you can advocate, making sure that the laws protect the victims. Mm. Um, even on a national level, um, it's the Violence Against Women's Act. That, that, that The Violence Against Women's Act is what funds a lot of the bigger organizations that they fund shelters, um, and things of that nature. And I believe the Violence Against Women's Act was signed back in 1993. And, you know, and forgive me for saying this, well, maybe don't forgive me, but Trump was the very first president, president that, that did not reenact the Violence Against Women's Act, which put a lot of people out of work um, wow. whose jobs were funded by that government um, entity. So, you mm. know... <laughs> Um, so pay attention who that, you vote for. <laughs> That's one way to advocate. So we've been writing letters um, to our congressmen and women saying, hey, we need to make sure that this act is reauthorized. And here's the reason why. So you can write letters to your state representatives. You can write letters to your senators. You can visit the state capitol. If there's something that bothers you, you have to act on it. Um, the House of Representatives is your house. And so one of the other bills that we're trying to work on now is making sure that people who are in the beauty industry have access to domestic violence trainings. And we have to do that from a legislative standpoint, where if it gets passed as a law, that means that when you go to beauty school or hair school, cosmetology school, there will be a piece on there where you learn domestic violence 101 so that you can identify it in your clients. And reason being, it just makes sense. That's where women share a lot of their personal information in the beauty salon. Um, and there's just certain things that you can recognize as a stylist that can tell you if this person is being abused. You can yeah. Maybe you'll see bruises on them or maybe they have to have their hair a certain way or a girl. Yeah. It cuts me out if I cut my hair. Just certain things that you can notice. So making sure that they're trained. Um, oh, that's great. Those are forms of advocacy. Those are ways that you can advocate for victims. That is amazing. Gosh, I love it. I love it. I'm learning so much. I'm over here taking (laughs) notes, girl. I am. Uh, Well, Tamiko, you know, you and I could probably talk for another three hours. Uh, I know. (laughs) know And it's an important topic. So I'm so glad that you allowed the time to really dig deep into this. Yeah, this is good. I just love, you know, meeting all of these amazing women who who are doing so much um, to help those who are surviving, who are in it, who are, you know, trying to heal. It's just, 
it's so imperative that we keep this conversation going and recognize this is something that's really important and it's affecting so many people and people that we know who just aren't saying mm-hmm. anything, you know, check on us, check on somebody sometime, you know? Yes. So, yes. Um, I appreciate you. Tamiko, where can people purchase your book? That's the number one question because I know uh, people need to grab this book. Yes. So, um, Wounds to Wisdom, I'm Still Standing. It's my personal testimony of going through domestic violence, over, overcoming it, and then what I call living a winning lifestyle after abuse. Um, you can get it on Amazon.com, and it's also available on my website, TamikoLawry.com. And as a matter of fact, right now, um, the ebook is on my website for only five bucks. So you can go and download it right now today. Oh, hey, come through deals. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, um, and then we can follow you on Instagram and Facebook as well. Yeah, so all of my social media is the same, at Tamiko Lowry Pugh. Um, I think I have the same outfit on on every single one. You'll see the little <laughs> purple dress. So that's me, at Tamiko Lowry Pugh on all social media outlets. She's so fabulous. I love it. Well, Tamiko, yeah. thank you so much for joining me and just sharing your time and your story with us. And I always have my uh, guests leave the podcast with an affirmation it starts with i am and then you just fill in the blank all right i am (laughs) i am embracing the new stronger version of me yes i love it you're so strong girl i'm giving you a big old hug as are you through the computer thank you so much thanks to if you want to find out more about respect my crown and respect my crowns podcast maybe you missed our last episode or maybe you even missed the last two seasons i certainly hope not but you can do that by going to the website respectmycrown.com you can also find out about our upcoming events and more thank you for tuning in i am jillian jj simmons and you are listening to respect my crown the podcast